Uh, thanks so much for reading the Frankenstein uh, chapters the other night. I'm really excited to talk to you about those today. Um, my name is Miranda Butler. I'm one of the TAs. Um, I introduced myself last week. Some of you are in my class. Um, so I'm a fourth year PhD student in English here at UCR. Uh, and what I do is a combination of a lot of really exciting things. Um, I'm part of the Speculative Fictions and Cultures of Science program, um, which you can do as part of an undergraduate minor or part of an emphasis in a graduate program. It's really exciting here at UCR. It's one of the most unique things about our programs. Um, and so there, I'm interested not only in science fiction and speculative fiction, um, but in the history of science and the interaction between literature and science. And for me, one of the most interesting places to look for that is in the 19th century, um, especially Victorian literature, British literature. Uh, but 19th century in general is something I'm really passionate about, really excited to talk about today. Um, and I'll get to dig into some of the like sensational like things that make it what it is and that make it so memorable and that make it stick with us uh, even 200 years later, like we're going to talk about uh, with Frankenstein. Um, so this lecture uh, is called A Tale of Two Frankensteins, and it's something I've been into a lot lately because I'm working at the Eaton Collection's 200 Years of Frankenstein exhibit, and we have the original of the uh, 1818 and the 1831. They're very cool, they're old, they're beautiful, they smell nice. You can go in and look at them. Uh, when I was deciding to go to grad school, that was one of the things that convinced me I should come, is that I got to go to a tour of the Eaton Collection and look at these books. And one of my colleagues asked if she could smell it, and I just said, all right, I've, I've got this <laughs> in my hands. I've got other people around me who are passionate about this. Um, but what are those differences? Why does it matter which one it is, how old it is? Uh, those are going to be some of the things that I talk about. Um, so raise your hand if you have read Frankenstein before. Oh, awesome. Yeah, great. Uh, so I don't know what versions you have read. I'm going to try to be consistent with my own uh, thing. This is the version I uh, read in maybe my junior year of college. It's like this broad view one. Uh, does anyone remember reading this one or the Norton Critical that's on the right? Okay, see how, how few of you that is? Uh, does anyone remember reading this one on the left or a Kindle one? Uh, okay, maybe we don't remember which ones we read. That's all right. Uh, this one, this one on, uh, I guess, your right, my left, is the one that is most commonly assigned. I was assigned this in uh, high school. Uh, I was assigned it in my first year of college when I was kind of more starting off. Um, and so what I'm doing in these uh, slides that you're going to see up here is being consistent with the way that that website I showed you introduced the two different versions. And I'm putting the 1818 on, like I said, your guys' left. I'm making sure I don't mess up. And uh, the 1831 on your guys' right. And as I was reading Susannis' Unflattening, this became so exciting to me because scholars like to debate about which version of Frankenstein is the real one. There were significant changes. You guys saw a few of them. I'll talk about more. Uh, so they say, well, which one is true? Which one should we use? Uh, there were revisions in 1831, but Mary Shelley approved them. She made them herself. So is that the version uh, that she would prefer us to read? Is that more true to you know, the ultimate product? We know that authors change and artists change and develop their ideas over time. Um, so what I want to do is explore that question and think of you know, the Susannis idea not only with different views uh, from different people, but different views from the same person, from the same woman, Mary Shelley, who wrote it uh, you know, as a teenager and then made changes later based on some of the things that were happening in her life and based on some of the things that publishers and editors might be interested in. Um, so we probably know the background of Mary Shelley, but if you need a refresher, I definitely wanted to have that up here. Um, so Mary Shelley was the daughter of William Godwin and Mary Wollstonecraft. Uh, these are political figures. They did important things uh, with kind of liberal progress, uh, feminism. Uh, so she's, she's the daughter of really great thinkers, really smart people, forward-thinking people. 
Um, and even though it wasn't a traditional education that she got, uh, because of some of you know, the ways that women's education was still different at that time, um, so she was born right at the end of the 18th century. Um, so basically, you know, she, she had a very good education, even if it was informal. Her mother died when she was young, but her father was very passionate about reading and uh, making sure that she really understood a lot of exciting texts. Um, so you'll see in Frankenstein, those of you who have read it before, she's well-versed in Milton. She's well-versed in the Romantics. Uh, she's well-versed in also science and, sh and, and the developments and changes that are happening in medicine and uh, you know, all of those things that eventually play a part in the novel. Um, but interestingly, because her dad was a political figure, someone that people knew and followed and, and corresponded with, they were interested in his ideas, uh, Percy Shelley, who was married to someone else at the time, um, met Mary through her father when Mary Shelley, uh, they had probably met or, or at least known of each other before that, but when Mary Shelley was about 16, um, to be fair, he was like 21. It's not as creepy as it sounds, but it's still pretty bad. Um, they, they met each other. They kind of had a romance, um, but he was married. They had a lot of problems. Her father, even though he knew uh, Percy Shelley, wasn't crazy about it, as you might imagine. Uh, he thought his daughter was a little bit young for this. He thought it was a questionable situation. Um, and so one of the things that uh, Mary and Percy did was they went on this trip um, to kind of get away from some of the stigma and to go off and have a romantic adventure. Um, and so they went off, one of the places uh, was Geneva. This is where famously, uh, so it was Mary Shelley, uh, Percy, uh, then I guess she was uh, Godwin, um, Lord Byron, John Polidori, who you might not have heard of, but I'll tell you a bit about. Um, and this was during the year without a summer. Um, and so this is the famous ghost story contest that you've probably heard about. Uh, can you can, like nod or tell me if you've heard about this? Ooh, I got a couple no's, but lots of yeses. Uh, that's great. So for the couple of no's, uh, so Lord Byron, we know Lord Byron, mad, bad, and dangerous to know. That's what his mistress said about him. Um, I once made a sim of him and just made him have like a slew of people coming into the house because he was very romantic uh, and very uh, like charming. He wrote a lot of great works, but was a person that people knew, people questioned. Um, and in this uh, ghost story contest, he was a part of that. Uh, they had been talking about uh, a lot of things. They were inside for a long time. Um, and John Polidori is the one we might not know. Uh, John Polidori was friends with these guys, but he wrote a short uh, novella called The Vampire, with a Y. Uh, and this was actually, a lot of scholars argue, using Lord Byron as what in kind of English Western tradition we think of as the first uh, like sexy romantic vampire. Uh, he was a nobleman, he was very attractive, uh, and so John Polidori wrote this story about kind of a womanizing uh, vampire who took advantage of young women, and again, people say that they based that character on Lord Byron because they were there with him. Uh, and then Percy Shelley uh, wrote some things that wouldn't be published until later, and Mary famously wrote Frankenstein. Um, and so this was them being trapped indoors during a cold, rainy summer, uh, coming up with these ideas, talking with each other, and that's the famous origin story of Frankenstein. Mary Shelley herself like romanticizes it a little bit uh, and tells us about it later. Um, so we know about this year without a summer. Many of us might even know that it was uh, caused by a volcanic eruption, um, but it's not just the you know, exciting, like cold, dark, dreary gothic that gets infused into the works created by this year without a summer. Uh, so the eruption of Mount Tambora in 1815 actually had a lot of really interesting effects 
on the environment, uh, like climate change and just the way that things looked, the food that people were able to grow. Uh, some uh, scholars say that the opium trade kind of exploded because uh, it was growing better than other crops and people needed to make money. I mean, a ton of historical events can be linked to this eruption, which was, you know, kind of far away but had such a huge impact on uh, basically the entire world at the time. Um, and so this is a zoom in on a famous painting of uh, the aftermath. I mean, for years and years, the climate continued to be different. Um, and one of the effects is uh, in recent years when we've had similar uh, events, we see that the sunset becomes like really yellow from like ash and things in the atmosphere. Um, so not only were they staying inside because it was cold, but the environment around, uh, around Mary Shelley, who remember was like 18 years old, uh, is, is like hauntingly, eerily different and beautiful and weird. Uh, the weather is different. Um, disease, again, as I mentioned, uh, climate changes can affect a lot of things. Uh, and other scholars suggest that the cholera epidemic uh, in England and in Europe was partially linked to some of these weather uh, patterns. And so the world might have seemed to be ending, um, or at least the start of something new, at least something very different. Um, and so all of these atmospheric, uh, both literally and metaphorically, uh, changes were going into Mary Shelley's writing of the novel. Um, and so one of the other things, uh, if you've taken 20A with me, you've seen me use this. Uh, one of the other things to think about with the end of an era and the start of a new era or changing uh, things is that Mary Shelley was on this interesting cusp, not only in, like I said, the year without a summer, but in the history of literature. Um, so her husband, Percy Shelley, uh, when I teach 20A, I find that students have trouble telling apart the first wave romantics like Wordsworth and Coleridge from the later romantics like Keats and Shelley and Byron, uh, and that everybody might seem to blur together because, you know, they're waxing poetic about nature and, you know, time and whatever. But actually, these people were very different, um, and you can see these kind of shifts in their ideas. And one of the things I do is I categorize them into Harry Potter houses. I know it's silly, but it helps me uh, because we think of Shelley and Byron as these later ones. They're not the kind of like noble Gryffindor Wordsworth doing the new thing for the first time and being brave and like saying they're going to write for the people, uh, nor the like particularly uh, quirky, Coleridge-y, uh, you know, Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner people. Um, but it's a later idea that um, Shelley is like striving for, uh, you know, his own kind of work and he's declaring what he thinks poetry should be. Um, and with Byron, they're, you know, they're kind of a eh, questionable team. They're young. They're living like, you know, living life, uh, like I said, married to someone else, but still meeting other mistresses. Like this is the kind of uh, the, the kind of legacy that goes into um, not only the second wave romantics, but also Mary Shelley's experience with these literary movements. Um, so later in Frankenstein, you'll see her actually quote Coleridge. Um, she also quotes other people. Um, but what I also want to show with this image is that uh, Mary Shelley, she wrote Frankenstein in 1818, um, or 1816, it was published in 1818. And then she died in 1851. So she's also like in this weird spot. Um, a lot of people, when they hear that I study Victorian literature, or when I talk about Victorian literature, like to classify Mary Shelley in there as well. Um, and that's really interesting because the last Jane Austen novels, which I think of as very different from a Victorian novel much earlier, um, were being written right before Frankenstein, like 1816, I think is the last Jane Austen novel. Um, so when you're looking at this history, it's like she's on the cusp of all these different things. She's with these romantics. But when I say that the second wave romantics are the 1820s, that's actually when they all died. Uh, they died young. Uh, they died 1821, 1822, 1824. Um, so that then she's still there. This person who used to hang out with uh, the romantics and who was on, you know, with these weird new ideas. And now she's moving into the modern era. 
Uh, she doesn't recognize or is trying to figure out things. Um, so if you've never read some of Mary Shelley's other work, her later novels are really weird. I'm sure it's this apocalyptic one called The Last Man. It's just like, what, what's even happening? Uh, but, but her life and her confusion and the changes that she goes through are evident in those kinds of works. Um, and so again, when we're setting up, this is just you know, the 1818 and then looking into some of the later stuff that would change what happens in 1831. Um, so we've talked about the people around her a little bit. Picture a young Mary Shelley with these hotshot, kind of different, uh, interesting, exciting, questionable people. Um, but that means that not only did they influence her thinking or give her ideas, but literally contributed to uh, the 1818 Frankenstein. Um, so before we even begin comparing 1818 versus 1831, um, we have to think about well, 1818 is the way it was published, um, but it was obviously written uh, by hand on a manuscript before that. When Mary Shelley was writing, she was right sitting, sitting in the, the castle, as we kind of picture it, uh, with the, the storm outside, writing by hand. Um, and so one of the things that happened, and we can read it a variety of ways, is that uh, Percy was actually editing her manuscript. Um, and so... One of the scholars who writes about this is Charles E. Robinson, uh, and he did a really interesting thing where he published a, a work called The Original Frankenstein, uh, where you can see the way that Mary Shelley wrote it in her manuscript and then compare, sort of like we did with 1818 and 1831, the changes that Percy Shelley added um, or, or made significantly different. Um, and so some of those I've put up here, uh, we could say a few of them are pretty minor, um, or even like good, you know, you need an editor when you're an author, you need someone to help refine what you're talking about. Um, and so Percy Shelley was good at developing the scientific and political themes. You know, it's a famous work of literature that high school students study, you got to have those themes in there. Uh, but also quite characteristically, uh, if you know Percy Shelley, he adds these like luxurious descriptions in. One of the ones he wrote is lustrous black hair when they're describing the monster. Like, it, it's, to me, when I read it, sometimes I'm looking at it and I just think, oh, Percy, what are you doing in, in this novel? <laughs> what are you doing? Um, and hopefully someday, you know, if a lot of you guys are English majors, you can get to the point where regardless of having the actual comparison in front of you, um, sort of like Nick Susanis' points of view show us, you can start to see other people's point of view or other people's ways of writing or thinking coming into what you're reading. Um, so those were some of the smaller ones, but Percy Shelley also made the monster more human. Um, which is interesting, because I'll show you a review of Frankenstein in a minute, which is something um, that, first of all, our cultural version, the films, don't often show a very human-like creature. And second of all, a lot of the critics, uh, that was the thing they were not sure of, is this creature who could read and write and like feel these intensely complicated um, human, like moral and ethical and, and personal feelings. Um, so... Those were some of the things he did um, in the thematic sense, but he also changed the wording. Mary wrote that the fangs of the monster were grasping into her neck, uh, or into Victor's neck, sorry. Uh, but what changes is that Percy makes it the fingers of the monster. Um, so uh, not only has the thematics changed, but also the actual wording. And then we can you know, reverse that and say, well, if it's fingers, it's going to really significantly change the way we view um, the, the creature's actions. Um, as opposed to being a wild animal, he's got these human you know, opposable hands. Like He's doing this kind of action. Um, Percy Shelley, returning to themes, was also uh, including adding in parts that argued that society had created the monster. Um, a lot of those themes that you talk about in maybe a high school class came out of Percy wanting to develop that and make that apparent um, in the book. Um, and again, those things might make it better or more interesting, but the fact is that they're there um, even if we think we're reading the original 1818. Um, so we've, we've talked about Percy a little bit just now, and another influence that Percy had was that he knew a lot of science uh, people, like, uh, not, not necessarily, like, 
um, he was doing science himself, but that he was having these conversations. Um, and remember, in the early 19th century, uh, science was starting to become more modern, medicine, things like that were sort of becoming what they would be to us someday. Um, but natural philosophy was the way that people used to view and describe science. Um, and so a lot of these discussions that Percy Shelley was having with, you know, sort of quote-unquote scientists were philosophical and theoretical in nature, uh, like the question of life itself. What is life? What makes life up? Of course, you can have scientific answers to that, um, but a philosophical and kind of like theoretical approach is also necessary uh, to really understand that topic. Uh, so Percy Shelley's physician, his personal doctor, was a famous materialist named William Lawrence. Um, and a materialist was the kind of emerging modern view of science uh, determining what life is. So that life is when an organism's working parts work. Uh, that it's a mechanical, you know, we could think of it metaphorically like a machine kind of functioning in the appropriate way, that that's what life is, and that there's nothing else that makes someone alive or dead, right? The, the machine stops working, and then they're dead. There's not, no other uh, significant thing that determines that. Um, but this was working against uh, an earlier tradition um, called vitalism or vitalist ideas, um, the vital principle, the, anything that has vital in it is, is how you might hear this described, um, and so Humphrey Davy was a natural philosopher who called science creative. Um, and this is particularly interesting because at that time, saying it was creative had religious connotations. Um, so it didn't mean like, yeah, you've got to solve problems in creative ways. It meant like that a scientist could potentially create, could potentially reanimate, could potentially bestow something other than, you know, the obvious mechanical function of the machine onto, you know, life. Um, so this went uh, the religious route in many ways. People who like to believe in something like a soul uh, would argue for a, a vital principle or a life principle. Um, but also you could view this in a scientific way. And one of the things that made vitality, like, scientifically plausible was experimentation in electricity. Um, so I'll put up one of the famous ones we know with Frankenstein in a minute. Um, but the description that the spark of life, that life itself could be like an electrical current, like a fluid moving through the body, um, that was linked to vitality and to the possibilities that Mary Shelley decided to explore uh, in her novel. So uh, when we look at the 1818 edition, we can see that Percy Shelley is really uh, quite present. Even William Godwin is quite present. Uh, but one of the interesting things is that it was not attributed to Mary Shelley. Um, so there was rumor going through uh, you know, the literary circles and things that Percy Shelley had written it. Um, he wrote a preface for Mary Shelley. Um, so there, there were some ideas to that extent, um, but the idea that, that it was Mary herself who had overheard people talking about these vital and material ideas and electricity and, and all of that uh, didn't seem to occur to anyone until a bit later uh, when you know, the history of the novel became more known and actually became a part of the novel itself, um, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, so this cool picture right here, uh, it's even cooler if you blow it up and look at it, we have a really good HD version, is the 1818 uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, published in three volumes. This was a common practice in the 19th century. Uh, they're little, they're pretty, you could take them with you, you could read them. Um, and that's the way that it was published, again, not under the name Mary Shelley, uh, but with the constellation of all of these ideas that had contributed to it, uh, like I mentioned just a second ago. Um, so that's how it came to be. Um, but the, the experiments that we know, that we think of, um, and that would become more well known as a part of it, uh, for example, in Percy's, uh, Percy's preface, he writes about Erasmus Darwin, and Mary Shelley writes about him as well later. Uh, so these life uh, principle experiments that get referenced in relation to Frankenstein 
First of all, are uh, you know the famous frog leg experiment uh, that Luigi Galvani in the 1790s had done, where he you know reanimated, got it to move with electricity. Uh, but there's also, again, connecting this question of science and philosophy and approaching uh, science in a literary, speculative way, like we might talk about in this class. Um, Erasmus Darwin, so that's the grandfather of Charles Darwin, uh, was this really interesting uh, character, figure, historical person, um, who wrote a couple of like epic poems about nature, um, about evolution, about plant reproduction, uh, the Temple of Nature is one from the end of his life where he's actually having proto-evolutionary theories um, before his you know, grandson Charles would really establish those in the 18, uh, like late 1850s, 1860s. Um, and one of the things Erasmus Darwin wrote about was some little organisms uh, he had observed that were able to kind of spontaneously come back to life um, basically because they live in water, and if they were dried out and then kind of like given some water again, they could like seem to come back to life when they had seemed to be dead. Um, and so this is what scholars say Mary Shelley uh, or Percy Shelley are referring to when they credit uh, Erasmus Darwin or Dr. Darwin, as he's called in uh, the preface to Frankenstein, for some of the scientific ideas. Um, Mary Shelley uh, and Percy Shelley uh, comically get this word vorticella wrong, and I think they use a word for a kind of pasta, which other scholars have also written about as like a, a fun mistake to examine, even if it was not accurate. Um, but this is some of the stuff that's going into uh, Percy Shelley and Mary Shelley and all of the questions. So, you know, when we see in the film, I put it's alive over here, uh, when we see those questions of life and death, they interestingly don't manifest in the novel the way that they do in later film adaptations, um, but it's still a question worth pursuing of what it means to bring something to life and to create something as well. Um, so I mentioned that I would have uh, information about the contemporary reception of Frankenstein. Uh, and so this is the first review by Sir Walter Scott of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. It's a really fun read. He praises the novel. He says the author is great. He says, if it's really Percy Shelley, uh, as the rumors suggest, you know, he's doing good work, good for him. Um, but of interest to our class is the way that those scientific ideas I've mentioned uh, are doing something that to this reviewer, this famous reviewer, seem quite new. Uh, and so when he's describing it, it's actually the opening of his review. He says, OK, before I can even talk about this novel, I have to figure out the quote unquote species is the word he uses, the species of this novel. Uh, to me, that reads as like the genre. What is this? What is happening? What's it doing? Uh, people think of it as gothic and romance and those kinds of ideas, uh, which it certainly is. Um, but he wanted to investigate the philosophical and refined use of the supernatural in Frankenstein. Um, so, of course, there could maybe have been some sensational novels that talk about uh, fantastical or supernatural ideas. But to him, uh, there was something really purposeful uh, that we've just seen in Mary Shelley's own story about how the science was being used. Um, so he continues to explain that the laws of nature are altered um, in the novel, making some things possible uh, that might not actually be, um, in order to show the probable effect of the supposed miracles and open up new channels of thought. So in other words, uh, Mary Shelley was able to change uh, the way or uh, kind of guess of the way that the science could work in order to speculate about what might be possible, what questions it might offer us. Um, and so this is a really interesting review. I love the phrase, open up channels of new thought, as kind of one of the purposes identified even early on in Frankenstein um, and its history. Uh, so that 1818, uh, we have this version. It's very refined, very philosophical. Um, it, it gets very popular. Uh, 1831, though, why does this version exist? Um, before we dig into the personal questions about what changed in Mary Shelley's biography or in history and culture, uh, we also just have to know about the people who wanted this to be published. 
Um, they were called Colburn and Bentley. They published these big series of you know, uh, novels. Basically, they reproduced famous books so that they were cheaper for like, middle class people to buy. Um, so those three volumes that I showed you on a previous slide were very expensive. You had to buy them separately. Um, and this, uh, this edition, uh, this way of printing books was a cheaper one volume version. You just buy one book for the one price. Um, and the way that Colburn and Bentley managed to make all this money and do all of this was that they would get books uh, that they didn't need to like buy new copyright for. So of course Mary Shelley's life changes the, the way she makes these changes, uh, but these changes are you know, being suggested so that this book company can make money. Um, and interestingly enough, the fact that then these people who are you know, in it for the money have the, have the new copyrights of Frankenstein caused problems until about 1860 with you know, future uh, companies and groups wanting to reproduce the novel. Um, and so 1818, I started off this lecture with this constellation of excitement and change and new, uh, you know, being on the cusp of new ideas um, and also, you know, this new romance, all of this stuff. Um, but the deaths of a lot of people that Mary Shelley loved not too long after the publication of the first Frankenstein really affected her uh, personally, as we would imagine, also her philosophical worldview, also her writing and thinking. Um, I mentioned The Last Man, uh, which is her last novel, and uh, you know, later in her life, she can't even really remember who her characters are and what's happening in her own book because perhaps she's depressed or she's struggling with uh, you know, some, some medical uh, effects of the struggles in her life. Um, so in the, the 1820s, she experiences the deaths of her daughter and her son and her husband and Lord Byron. Um, it's a really bad time. Um, and Mary Shelley had had a lot of miscarriages. She had had a lot of trouble with children. Um, which was very uh, difficult for her, very emotionally draining on her. And so in those intermediate years bef between the two editions were published, uh, really a lot, a lot of bad things had happened. Uh, and so what we see in the different versions as a result of this is that in 1818, we've got all these scientific ideas, but Victor has the free will to explore them. Um, in 1831, the universe is ruled by forces beyond uh, anyone's control. Um, so again, Mary's uh, husband, Percy, died in this accidental drowning that just didn't even make any sense. Um, her children, right, she didn't know uh, what was making her have trouble having children, have trouble with her children. So it just might have seemed like the world was conspiring against her. Um, and so this forces, this destiny, uh, these problems that could not be overcome became a big part of the 1831 edition. Um, and so one of the things that we see is the direct parallel between Mary's descriptions of the changes in her own life and uh, Victor Frankenstein. Um, so in 1827, Mary wrote... Uh, and this is kind of the original spelling and punctuation. So I love this, you know, destiny with a capital D. This is definitely uh, the way that she is picturing this. Uh, the power of destiny I feel every day pressing more and more on me. And I yield myself a slave to it in all except my moods of mind, which I endeavor to make independent of her, i.e. destiny. Um, so she's trying to have this intellectual escape from this tragedy, and it's very hard for her. Um, this is very comparable to Victor Frankenstein's descriptions um, and the way that he tells his story of his misfortune. So strangely are our souls constructed, and by such slight ligaments are we bound to prosperity or ruin. Destiny was too potent, and immutable laws had decreed my utter and terrible destruction." Um, so again, that hopelessness, that, faith, uh, that fatalism that Mary is expressing gets directly brought into Victor Frankenstein's perspective of his own you know, trials and troubles. Um, and so one of the things I want to also add with the 1831 edition is that uh, Mary Shelley wrote a description of her inspiration 
Um, because, you know, this whole exciting story, the year without a summer, this ghost contest with famous people, had become interesting to the public and had made the novel more desirable. Um, so she tells this story, uh, and the way she describes it is that she saw the pale student of unhallowed arts kneeling beside the thing he had put together. I saw the hideous phantasm of a man stretched out and then, on the working of some powerful engine, show signs of life and stir with an uneasy, half-vital motion. Frightful must it be, for supremely frightful would it be the effect of any human endeavor to mock the stupendous mechanism of the creator of the world. Um, so we see those vital and material ideas kind of coming into play as the boundary between life and death, life itself and lack thereof, gets crossed as Victor Frankenstein uh, would ultimately make this terrible discovery. Um, and so when she describes it, she says uh, that the student of the unhallowed arts um, is, is terrified of what he has done. And so that's also something that gets brought into the 1831 and the legacy of the novel, um, and also that a lot of people have like funny, I guess, complaints about. Um, and so I want to show you this picture that's in the background of my presentation. Uh, this is the frontispiece for the 1831 Frankenstein. Uh, so this was not in the 1818 one. This was added. Again, they're trying to sell these books and make them exciting, make people interested in them. And so this story of Mary Shelley getting her inspiration in this exciting way um, and then also what she imagines that action would be are depicted in that frontispiece. So, you know, Victor cowering from this hideous creation. It's a very interesting picture, um, and it gets, you know, really, uh, what's the word, uh, perpetuated in our culture as an image associated with this novel. Um, so this is Victor being very scared. Can we? Yeah, look, his his, his face is very pale. Uh, he's he's wimping, running away, um, and this uh, leads me into the way that Victor changes in the two versions of the novel, um, and really his kind of. I want to say, like, whininess um, gets emphasized in 1831. So if you hear people complaining about Victor being whiny, um, interestingly enough, it's true and it's, like, purposeful, one, because Mary Shelley imagined that this character would react this way, but also some of her own kind of extreme unhappiness is going into the voice of that character, potentially. Um, so this is uh, a little information about the frame story. So since most of you have read it, you're probably all right on this point. Um, but another interesting thing we know about Frankenstein is that it's framed by uh, the story told by Captain Walton, um, writing letters about this mysterious man who he has encountered. Um, so you also have this kind of circle of the story where uh, we get, you know, it ends uh, on the, you know, the ice and it begins on the ice um, as Captain Walton is on this uh, like North Pole exploration expedition um, and then encounters Victor Frankenstein and Victor Frankenstein tells him his story. Um, so one interesting side-by-side uh, -side comparison that's from the earlier chapters that you didn't read um, is where Victor and Captain Walton are first becoming friends and they're talking uh, and Walton says that he is an explorer and that he has these ambitions to like do great things that no man has ever done. Does this sound a little like Frankenstein? This is what Victor had said he was going to do. Um, and so in the first, in the 1818 version, Victor suggests uh, some alterations in Walton's plan, which Walton finds useful. Uh, and and uh, Walton says that Victor instinctively takes in the welfare of those who surround him. So Victor is a little more uh, personable. He's interested in, in helping another character. Uh, we could depict uh, or read the other version as trying to help, but it's a different kind of help. Uh, where Victor hears Walton's ambitions in the 1831 edition and says, Unhappy man, do you share my madness? Have you drank also of the intoxicating draft? Hear me, let me reveal my tale, and you will dash the cup from your lips. Right? He's like, oh, let me tell you, I know what's going on. You're going to like, aim too high. You're going to have the same problem that I have had. Uh, it's going to end terribly for you. Right? And so, again... 
we see that the free will of Victor kind of taking more uh, responsibility for his own actions versus telling Walton, hey, you are on a path and this path can only end one way, it doesn't matter what your intentions are, uh, shows a distinct difference, as we mentioned, between those two versions and how Mary Shelley's views may have changed uh, Victor Frankenstein's views. Um, and so this is leading us into chapter two, uh, which is where you guys started for your reading. You might have seen this on the internet if you're on Tumblr. I like really love finding truth in viral Tumblr posts. Um, so I put this up here today. There's this famous one that says, did Victor Frankenstein have his PhD? No one's answered my question. I really want to know. Uh, they say, this guy was an undergrad. Imagine hearing about the guy next to you in the dorms. Yeah, he dropped out because he built a person. Um, Victor Frankenstein had no degree at all, and then he was like, oh, these guys, they don't know what they're doing. Um, and he didn't even really drop out, he just kind of disappeared, and when, <laughs> when they came, uh, when he was going to class, he said, I know more than anyone in this school, and one day I'm going to prove it by ending death itself, uh, right? So this is part of those chapters that you read, and I find this very funny, but I find it funny because this is probably by people who have read our 1831 version of Victor Frankenstein, and they're like, ah, this emo kid Victor spent 90% of the novel moping. Uh, he doesn't do anything else. And they quote this part, my only solace was silence, deep, dark, death-like silence, like how extra. Um, <laughs> so he's, he, the, the truth in this post, and the reason I bring it up is because I have a theory as a scholar that these people have correctly read the 1831 edition. And they see the suffering, they see the blame, um, and they also see this uh, young kind of misfortune of a young man uh, who has had such a terrible thing go wrong, as Mary Shelley, as a young woman, uh, has had so many terrible things go wrong. Um, so this leads us to answer this person's question, Victor goes to university, uh, what's going on in those chapters and why do they matter and what is the whole point of me showing you that goofy post? So when Victor goes to university, um, his, uh, his education in the 1818 is just kind of like he shows up to school, he's going around the classroom. Um, you guys read this, right? He's like, yeah, and then I w went into the first classroom and I saw the first guy. Uh, but in 1831, Victor says, chance, capital C, or rather the evil influence, the angel of destruction, which asserted omnipotent sway over me, led him to discuss Paracelsus, uh, led him to meet the professors in the order that he did. Uh, so this is, again, that kind of like extreme emotional response to his situation. Um, and so this kind of returns to our science bits um, the chapters that you didn't read list the people who Victor Frankenstein as a character was interested in. One of those was Paracelsus, who uh, was an occultist and an alchemist um, and was pursuing some of these really, uh, you know, intense questions in this occult kind of way. Um, and so Victor says that, you know, that interest was just his fate to be interested in those outdated ideas and then to discuss them with somebody who would be interested in them. Um, and so when you meet the professors or his kind of mentor figures, the one thing that I think our, our viral Tumblr post doesn't get quite right is that Victor Frankenstein doesn't like come in knowing everything. Um, he comes in and he is guided by these professors in the sciences um, and scholars uh, have written, you can read a great description of it um, in this book. Uh, it's the, the Broadview Frankenstein with uh, some notes by uh, D.L. MacDonald and Kathleen Scherf. Um, but they argue that these two professors in chapter two can represent those two approaches to the sciences. Um, so again, now we have the kind of uh, parallax vision again of these different people's approaches um, to life itself and how they're going to uh, be training Victor into what he will ultimately do. Um, so Waldman is the, the vitalist in the, uh, the story. Um, and so he is the one that has this like creative point of view, uh, like Davy. He's he's into the ancient uh, 
ancient ideas, these outdated ideas that our, and this is the quote, like our enlightened century, our enlightened age has changed. Um, so Crumpy represents the materialist, the objective science, um, the, uh, the, the materialism that we had seen um, creeping into the conversations of Mercy, uh, Mercy, <laughs> Mary Shelley and Percy Shelley. Uh, so it, it's not, not wrong to kind of just blend them into one. Um, so we have, uh, we have these two approaches being represented in the book, and that's why these chapters are important and why uh, reading them side by side can show us, like, yes, uh, Mary Shelley's 1818 questions of science are still present in the 1831, but the kind of purpose and agency that she ascribes to those ideas and to, you know, the character's own actions are completely different um, from, you know, the 1818 and the 1831. Um, so one of the other things I wanted to mention that happens in the chapters you guys didn't read uh, was also how this idea of fate um, could tie into the earlier part, the other characters of the novel, and also why when you started chapter two in the one version, it was chapter three in the other version. One of the things that she chooses to add uh, is more background information about Victor's family in uh, the 1831 as compared to the 1818. Um, the 1818, uh, so you picked up with Victor going to college and he leaves Elizabeth. Um, Elizabeth is his cousin in 1818. This is very straightforward. Uh, literally, the, uh, the daughter of his uncle or, or what, uh, his aunt and uncle. Uh, so that she's just physically a, a relation to him. Some people argue that Mary Shelley might have changed that because, you know, questions of incest. Um, but remember, in the 19th century, like, uh, marrying your cousin wasn't as uh, weird as we think of it today. Um, so we could also read more into why she might have been his cousin in 1818, um, but then with someone very different in 1831. Um, so again, 1818, she's the cousin. Um, and they, they grow up together, their personalities complement each other, they get along very well. That's the way that she's originally written. Um, but in 1831, there is some weird stuff that happens with the changes in Elizabeth's character. Um, and so you can read about this in depth. I put the citation at the top in a book called Mary Shelley, Her Life, Her Fiction, Her Monsters um, by Ann Mel uh, Meller. Um, and so in 1831, Victor's mother is like traveling and finds a peasant woman, uh, hardworking, bent down by care and labor, distributing a scanty meal to five hungry babes. Among these, there was one which attracted my mother far above all the rest. Uh, she appeared on a different stock. The four others were dark-eyed, hard, hardly little vagrants. This child was thin and very fair. Uh, it's just super weird. It's like, oh, the mom is in this peasant town. She's helping some poor people because she's a good person, right? This is our, our problematic 19th century. Um, and then she sees this hungry family with like one blonde child among the brunette children and is like, clearly that should be mine. Um, <laughs> That's the story you get. I'm not making this up in 1831. Um, and so why would such a weird change uh, take place in 1831? Um, well, later in the book, we get descriptions of uh, Victor viewing Elizabeth as a gift to him. Um, yes, that's very creepy. Uh, but his mother brings this girl back and is like, you know, again, it's destiny. Like, we found this beautiful child uh, who's like your age and you're going to grow up together and like get married and, and it's going to be this thing that was always meant to be, um, which then, uh, you know, later when we get into potentially losing Elizabeth, um, that makes it more impactful that he was always destined to lose what he was always destined to have. Does that make sense? So she was to be his, but then, again, it just can't work out because that's not the way that destiny is going to allow Victor Frankenstein to live his life. Um, so these differences are very interesting, and I saw some of you in your like research questions were interested in feminism in the novel, um, which we can think of from like Mary Wollstonecraft and a lot of the other perspectives. But this female character uh, is a very interesting one uh, worth talking about. And the changes in the two versions of her character are very different as well. 
Um, when you guys picked up in chapter 2, you also saw right away, right, that in the one version, she gets deathly sick, and in the other version, she's like, only kind of sick. Uh, and the side-by-side -side comparison shows you that every word is literally the opposite. Um, and this continues to kind of happen with her character, where, you know, on the one, the one side, she's... Uh, like very passive, but on the uh, the other side, she's very much a part of uh, a good friendship with Victor, um, and so those changes really do uh, do matter. Um, so going back to where I was, um, basically one of the other significant changes besides um, Meller's argument. Let me see if I can uh, make it a little bigger. Um, but one of the other significant changes is that Victor's obsession, and this is kind of my side-by-side, -side, a way that I would like to read this, um, is always a part of the novel. Um, so when you guys got to the next chapter of um, really one of the reasons I assigned it was it's where it's describing Victor's obsession, his urge, his like all-nighter desire to, to discover this secret of life. Um, that stays very consistent. Um, so when you read it, you probably saw for a couple of panels, not a lot had really changed. Um, and so he gets obsessed with this question. Um, and if I can find it, I will read it to you. Um, but it's this question of where the principle of life comes from. Um, and so, yeah, here it is. Um, he says, one of the phenomena which had peculiarly attracted my attention was the structure of the human frame, and indeed any animal endued with life. Whence, I often asked myself, did the principle of life proceed? It was a bold question, and one which has ever been considered a, as a mystery. Um, and so he's pursuing again where life comes from. He gets really, really obsessed with it. Um, and this is where his description of that changes a lot. Um, so uh, both of them say that every night he was oppressed by a fever. Uh, he becomes nervous. He's like, uh, so this means nervous, like, you know, emotionally unstable. Um, but in the 1818 version, this is a physical obsession. Um, so it's like a literal sort of insomnia, a disease that I regretted the more because I had hitherto enjoyed most excellent health and had always boasted of the firmness of my nerves. But I believed that exercise and amusement would soon drive away such symptoms, and I promised myself both of these when my creation should be complete. Um, so again, we see that free will, uh, but it's free will over his own body and an understanding of what is happening within himself. And in the first version, he seems to be, yes, he's obsessed. Yes, he's unhealthy. Yes, he's staying up all night doing this crazy, crazy task. But he sees the physical effect on his body, and he knows how he can fix it when he chooses to, you know, go get some exercise, and then maybe he'll be better. Um, as opposed to 1831, um, where we get this additional description uh, where not only uh, is he nervous to the most painful degree, but the fall of a leaf startled me, and I shunned my fellow creatures as if I had been guilty of a crime. Um, so he gets more secretive. He's in his own head. He's, he's really, really doing this uh, intensely. Sometimes I grew alarmed at the wreck I perceived I had become semicolon, the energy of my purpose alone sustained me. Um, so we can see it's more of a metaphorical energy. It's not like a physical mania for him in this later version, uh, but he's, he's just staying in his head and he is perceiving, I love this word, what he had become. He's thinking about himself um, and only continuing to do the task that is psychologically damaging to him is the only thing that can like sustain his life. So rather than, like, he adds this part about exercise later, my labors would soon end, and I believe the exercise would then drive away the incipient disease. Um, but that's very, very different, that he's saying, well, once I've, like, totally completed my project, then I can take care of myself. Um, the way that that's represented, I think, is quite different, even though a lot of that chapter is very much the same. Um, so I'm interested in this as a comparison of how psychological the 1831 version gets. Um, and again, if you ever have a class where you get to really talk about 
um, psychoanalytics, or where you really get to talk about kind of historically responsible ways of reading mental illness or mental health problems, we could think about what Mary Shelley was going through. We could try to speculate about what uh, Victor is going through. But again, when you do that in literature, there's a whole set of tools to make sure that you're thinking about it in the way um, that's relevant for your time period and your discussion. Um, so returning to where, uh, where I started um, and my uh, enjoyment of memes and things like that, well, if we have these two books and someone's up here saying, you know, which one have you read? Which one should your teacher assign? Which one is better? Um, there's a lot of possible answers to that question. And even Frankenstein itself is a thing that when you're talking about, it can be hard to talk about. Um, so is there any true novel? Well, no, I guess right, they're both uh, good versions. You know, is there a true one? No, there's different ones, and there's kind of conglomerations of lots of them. Um, but which Frankenstein is better is also a great question. We could approach that from which version of Victor is better, right? We've got the whiny one that the Tumblr people make fun of. Um, but we've also got, you know, problems with the original character. Um, and we've also got the concept of, right, knowledge is knowing that Frankenstein is not the monster. Uh, pop culture and media and film where Frankenstein becomes the word for the creation itself. Um, so which version of that is better? Is it better to say, uh, no, we've got to be true to Mary Shelley's original. We can't call him the monster or we can't call him Frankenstein, um, right? I like to really throw a wrench into that because as our other kind of meme shows, it's not even a question you can really build on because there isn't quite an original Frankenstein. Um, so this is the one where at the end of the book, this person wrote, it's okay if you just call me Frankenstein instead of Frankenstein's monster. I really don't mind. Um, and the caption for this when it was, I mean, it was viral years ago. I'm, I'm not pretending I'm cool. Um, but when this was really popular a couple of years ago, the caption was, if only I'd have had this to end all of those pretentious debates. Right. So the people, you know, those people, those people who are like, yeah, I know some some stuff about literature and I'm going to be persnickety and prescriptivist about what literature can and can't be. Um, I like to question those and I like to kind of address them all. And I think Susanus's way of doing that is the very best possible way to ask ourselves, well, this idea of you know, which version is true is not really the right version of asking that question, but instead we can look at it, you know, from that kind of parallax vision perspective uh, that you see in Susanus. Um, so my answer to those questions and my way of wrapping this up is that Frankenstein also uh, kind of permeates pop culture as a prefix, you know, Frankenfish, that's a real sci-fi movie. Um, but there's also, you know, Frankenfood, Franken, like people like to use this prefix to describe things getting mixed together that maybe shouldn't be. Um, as we remember, Victor Frankenstein has built his monster from, you know, disparate parts. Uh, from like the graveyard and whatever. So uh, Frankenstein itself is a Franken novel. Um, it is actually lending itself to be like multiple and containing all these pieces um, because of its form and its history and content. Um, so I still have 15 minutes, I checked. So uh, I, I'll let you out when I'm done talking. Um, but the form of the novel, that epistolary, those approaches, some of you guys in my classes have already mentioned this as something that lends itself to reinterpretation. Um, that if we're only, if we're getting certain points of view or if we have the potential for other people's points of views to be inserted, or remember uh, Walton is writing down Victor's words so we don't know how true they are, this question of mediation uh, is a part of the novel, um, that certainly that can be a way of thinking of the novel itself as being Frankenstein. Um, the history, as we talked about with Mary Shelley and all of those factors uh, that made the 1818, that made the 1831, that made everything in between, um, those are also going to make it a mishmash of a lot of things. Um, and then the content itself, the fact that the whole premise of the novel is, you know, letting, letting things be combined and changed in ways uh, that are different views, that are reinterpretable, that are changeable, that are addressing these deep philosophical 
philosophical questions uh, lends itself to thinking of Frankenstein multiply um, and reinterpreting it. Um, and if I had, you know, all the weeks to talk about Frankenstein, these are some of the covers of the novel. Um, and there's also all of those film versions, too. So we see that not only for us as like literary scholars, the idea of approaching it and understanding all of these uh, ways that shaped Frankenstein are important, but there's also the fact that Frankenstein is going to go on and shape other things. Um, it's going to be reimagined as movies. It's going to, you know, take this character and then they're going to like put him into other stuff, you know, like Bride of Frankenstein and all like there's so many spin-offs and so many things. Um, there's like comic books, right? There's uh, video games, right? There's like all of these interesting things that happen with Frankenstein um, that take the original Frankening of it and then make it into something new. Um, so this is a little teaser and hopefully something to get you excited about continuing to think about the novel and thinking about your resources here at UCR. Um, so I mentioned that I'm working on this exhibit at the Eaton Collection right now called uh, Frankenstein at 200 for, right, 2018 next year, the 200 year anniversary. Um, hopefully, as my ideas have suggested to you, um, you know, it is the 200 year anniversary, but is it really? Uh, Frankenstein was always changing, is always changing. It continues to be part of our everyday, like, reading and pop culture, one of the most influential things that we see in more speculative fiction um, because of its multiplicity and all the ways you can use it. So, in the Eaton Collection next year, we'll have this great exhibit that features our 1818, our 1831. Also, there's hundreds of other versions. Um, we have a lot of cool stuff related to the film, um, the original films from, I mean, like 1931, very old, cool stuff, pictures, things like that. Um, and you'll also get to go to the Eaton Collection. This is a picture of the reading room. You'll get to go there uh, for this class. I believe you'll get more information about that later. Um, so really, I hope that today I've gotten to get you excited about Frankenstein, see how it's relevant to our theoretical approaches, and also relevant to future work you can do at UCR. So you can go now. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>